Good morning, good morning, good morning, and happy blessed Sabbath to you all, my brothers, sisters, and friends. Good morning and happy blessed Sabbath to you all. It is a great pleasure, honor, and an awesome blessing for us to be able to be here this Sabbath morning to study the Word of God, to praise and worship God both in spirit and in truth, because God has been so good to us throughout this entire week. God has been faithful to us this entire week. God has been faithful to you, and not just to you, but He's been faithful to me and to your family and to your friends. God has been faithful. And so it flows out of us to just say good morning and happy blessed Sabbath to every single one of you. It is true. It is the truth that God has been faithful to us all. So happy blessed Sabbath to you all. It's a one, you know, the truth is very, very important. We were on the prayer line earlier this morning and just, it just, I just had a sweet time with the saints. Again, another sweet time with the saints. And we were considering the fact that the truth of the grace of God is what strengthens us to live out this life in an already difficult world. And the truth about God is that God is faithful. God has been faithful to us. The truth is so important. The truth is that thing that helps you orient yourself in an already disoriented world. The truth is uh, the thing that when you know it and experience it, you are made free. When you are broken free, when you break free, from lies. When you finally break free from lies, you know what you begin to do? You begin to unlearn the things that you've learned before. You begin to untangle the, the things that you were tangled up in before. You thought that it was fine, but now in knowing the truth and rejecting the lies, you, you, you it's like you're in a school where you're unlearning the things that you learned before because now you know the truth that is making you free. The truth as it is in Jesus is that he is the way the truth, and the life. And anyone who goes to the Father must go through Christ. And there in that journey to the Father through Christ, as you're taking your steps with Christ, then you begin to experience conviction that leads you to peace. You begin to experience a conviction that leads you to peace, that leads you to restoration, that leads you to strength, that leads you to joy. So you go from joy to joy, from strength to strength, from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the living God, which he would have to fall afresh upon us even this morning. Thank God, not only for the Sabbath, but more so even for the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us and who gave himself so that we might live. Thank God for Jesus. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Aren't you and your family thankful for Jesus? If you are, then you shouldn't just keep that Jesus for yourself. You ought to share him with everybody else. So do take a moment to share this video with your brothers, sisters, and friends near, far, and wide. Let's get this video as far as possible. And we need to do this. Let's get this video as far as possible so that people who need the Lord can be reached. They can hear him and they can experience him in the same way as you have been throughout this series uh, where we've been studying the great controversy. I think it's been an amazing blessing to me. And I pray that it's been an amazing blessing to you as well, saints. So do share, do uh, give a thumbs up to the video, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook so that um, the YouTube and Facebook algorithm can get to work and uh, get this video uh, further out so that people can study along with us. We're going to be looking at chapter 36, chapter 36 in the book, The Great Controversy, chapter 36 and the impending, whoops, the impending conflict, the impending 
conflict. Um, also, if you'd like to join our prayer line, if you if you'd like to join our prayer line, our virtual prayer line, it's every Sabbath morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can join whichever Sabbath you'd like. Just send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. That is lastrayministries at gmail.com, right? Right, right, right there. Lastrayministries at gmail.com. And we will send you back a reply with the link so that you can join with us and and and, and join our our time of prayer. And I'm telling you, it's always a sweet time. Even this morning, we were talking about God's amazing grace and how because of God's amazing grace, we can experience gratitude through suffering. Because of God's amazing grace, we can experience gratitude through suffering. It's his grace that lifts us. It's his amazing grace that saves us. It's his amazing grace that gives us the strength and the joy um, to face anything that is before us in this life. So, we're without further ado, we're going to get into our study this morning um, and we're going to sing. But before we do that, we're going to have a word of prayer. Before we do that, we're going to have a word of prayer. So if you can assume a reverent position with me, wherever it is that you are, let us first begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this blessed Sabbath day. We thank you for this opportunity. Even now we can pray and reach out to you and thank you for who you are and all that you've done for us. We're grateful for this moment where we could uh, 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 experience relief, the relief that is found through your word, the relief that is found through singing um, to you and singing about your goodness, God. We would count our blessings and name them one by one. We would ha have an attitude of gratitude, God. We would, we would be grateful for all that you've done for us, especially throughout this week. And Lord, there have been times where maybe we have been less than the best, but you have been altogether lovely to us. And all the way you've brought us to this point in time, to this day, so that we can receive the fullness of your love, your grace, your mercy, and your truth. So, Father, we ask for your spirit to enter into our hearts in a special way. Lord, we ask that all those who we share this video with, that they may be reached and that they also may be touched by what you have for us to consider today. Bless us on this Sabbath. Make us holy so that we could experience this holy Sabbath day. If there's anything that I forget to mention in this prayer, Father, I ask in a special way that you would look upon your son, Jesus Christ, and everything that he deserves, that you may pour it out upon us. It's in his precious name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> uh, just a quick announcement on uh, if you guys have been following on Clear Distinction Ministries YouTube channel on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and on Sabbaths at 4 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, there is a, 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 a series that Brother Paul has coming up. Um, you know, that ha that has been going on, uh, Jesus on Prophecy. So we highly recommend that you follow along that, put that on your schedule on Clear Distinction Ministries YouTube channel um, on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and on Sabbath afternoons at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Times. There are, these are blessed studies that everybody should be considering and following along with um, Jesus on Prophecy. It's been an amazing blessing so far, and I pray that you and your family will be blessed by it. Also, make sure you're gathering the families. We're going to sing, and then after that, we're going to get into our study. As we're singing, take the moment to share and gather your families as we're going to be studying the Word of God through the book, The Great Controversy. So we're going to sing number 470. Number 470, there is sunshine in my soul today. Happy Sabbath, Sister Marva. Happy Sabbath, Sister Latonia. Happy, blessed Sabbath to you guys. It is an amazing blessing to see you, and it's Always a joy and a pleasure to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth on Sabbath mornings with you all. If you're wherever you're tuning in from, just just note where you're tuning in from, or just say Happy Sabbath. We always love when you're sharing in the comments. We love the activity, so do wish us a Happy Sabbath as we wish you a Happy Sabbath, and everybody else also that comes into chat. Let's wish one another a Happy Sabbath and greet one another in Jesus' name. But we're gonna be singing. There's sunshine in my soul today. Mm -hmm. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in the soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. There is sunshine, blessed sunshine. 
shine when the peaceful happy moments roll when jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in my soul there is springtime in my soul today for when the lord is near the dove of peace is in my heart the flowers of grace appear there is sunshine blessed sunshine when the peaceful happy moments roll when jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in my soul there is gladness in my soul today and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now for joys laid up above there is sunshine blessed sunshine when the peaceful happy moments roll when jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in the soul when jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in the soul amen when jesus shows his smiling face indeed there is sunshine sunshine in the soul there is sunshine in the soul good morning and happy sabbath to you as well sister tamara good morning and happy blessed sabbath to you um, it was wonderful again even this morning to be on this morning uh on the prayer line with you uh, and it's always it's always a treat it's always a great and amazing pleasure so we are going to enter in our study we're going to get right on into our study the great controversy the great controversy the impending conflict, the impending conflict. That's the chapter that we're on today. The impending conflict. That is chapter 36 in the book, The Great Controversy, The Impending Conflict. Make sure that you have gathered the homes. You see, again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say this again. We, we are told, we are told that the book, The Great Controversy, pardon me, the book, The Great Controversy, the book, The Great Controversy should be given out like the leaves of autumn. It should be given out everywhere. This book, The Great Controversy. Not only should we be giving this book out, God, I think he appreciates when we go above and beyond. God appreciates when we go above and beyond. So not only do we want to give this book out near, far and wide everywhere that we go, but sometimes people get the book and they would appreciate if somebody would read along with them, if somebody would study along with them. So God blessed giving us the opportunity, the wherewithal, the um, the, the apparatuses, um, or is it apparati, uh, to be able to, to do this, to share with them in the most convenient and the most effective way that we could think of, going through chapter by chapter of the book, The Great Controversy. You know, when, we, when we complete this book, we're going to have a big party, okay? We're going to have a big celebration. That's not to say that we have finished the work, but, um, but, it's, a, but, but, but it's, 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 it's a great thing to be able for us to have gone through the book, The Great Controversy, from cover to cover. You know, and sometimes people ask the question, have you ever read the, the book, The Great Controversy, from cover to cover? It's like, well, the book, The Great Controversy, from cover to cover? Look, we have we are studying this book from cover to cover. We've been going Sabbath after Sabbath, and I pray that you've been enjoying it. I pray that your family has been enjoying it, and you have been learning week after week after week after week that this book is really uh, talking about the 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 the, 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 the triumphant victory of justification by faith in the righteousness of Christ. That's what we've been seeing throughout this book as we're covering all the doctrines and all the truths that God has for us to understand. And this Sabbath is going to be no different. This Sabbath is going to be no different as we're looking at the impending conflict. We're looking at the impending conflict. This is a very important chapter in this book that we're going to be considering even now. Now, in this, in the description of this video, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, you're going to see the study guide is there and you want to follow along in the study guide because we're going to be going through the questions there in the study guide. So that will assist you to see some things that you may not have seen or pay attention to certain things that you may not have been paying attention to as you assumedly, assumingly have read the chapter this week. Okay. So here we are. Chapter one, chapter one, not chapter one, but chapter 30. Uh, six, chapter 36 in the book, The Great Controversy. We're here in chapter 36, and I'm just pulling it up on my iPad as well. And we're going to consider question number one. We're going to be considering question number one. I thought it was a little dry, so pardon me for pulling out the um, water bottle from time to time. But question number one, okay. 
what main issue of the age, of the age-long conflict between Christ and Satan is the subject of the final controversy? This is a very important question. And as we've been going through this book, I think it has been made very, very clear to us what the main issue is. It has been made very, very clear to us week after week, what is the main issue in the great controversy? What is the main issue in the great controversy between Christ and Satan? What is the main issue? What is the great issue in the great controversy? Well, <clears throat> we can find it here. We can find it right here, and I'll pull it up on the screen for us to consider. We can find it right here in the beginning of the chapter. It begins by saying, from the very beginning of the controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. So what has Satan's purpose been? Satan's purpose has been to overthrow the law of God. Now, what does the law of God reveal? What does the law of God reveal? Well, the law of God reveals the kind of person that God is. The law of God reveals the kind of person that God is. It reveals his character. God's law reveals his character. God's law is not a list of do's and don'ts for a people that cannot. God's law is a revelation of his character. That's what God's law is, okay? It's not a list of deeds to be done and sins to be shunned. But it is the revelation of God's character, okay? Now, yes, it does reveal the things that you should do and the, sin and the things that you should not do. But most importantly, it reveals the kind of person that God is. And so the devil, from the beginning, his controversy has been against the kind of person that God is. All right? The kind of person that God is. Now, jump down to the second paragraph. In seeking to cast contempt upon the divine statutes, Satan has perverted the doctrines of the Bible and errors have thus become incorporated into the faith of thousands who profess to believe the scriptures. The last great conflict, and this I underline because that is literally the answer. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the longstanding controversy concerning the law of God. So Satan's arguments is against the law of God. It is all against the law of God, which again is what? It is the revelation of God's character. It is a transcript of his character. Now, when understanding the law of God, I want to take some time here. I want to take some time on this point here of understanding what the law of God is. Yes, we understand it's the revelation of his character, but how are we to view the law? And this is repetition of some things that we've said before, but repetition deepens the impression. And I want you to get this. And that's why we repeat these points so that we can uproot misunderstandings that we have in our minds. Some misunderstandings that we have concerning the law of God are deeply rooted. And we want to lay the ax at the root. We want to go deep and uproot our misunderstanding of the law of God. Why is this so important? This is important because the devil has sought to change times and laws. The devil has sought to change times and laws. And this, so this seeking of the change of laws is not limited to just uh, removing the second and the fourth commandment and just kind of shifting things, uh, kind of uh, uh, spreading things out so that it could still remain 10. Okay, it goes deeper than that. And we have to allow it. We have to realize that it goes deeper than just the removal or the change of the second and the fourth commandment. When the devil is seeking to change times and laws, when he's seeking to change laws, he's not merely seeking to literally change laws. He's seeking to change our view of the law. He's seeking to change our understanding of the law because he knows that if we understand the law other than how God needs us to understand it, then we're going to misunderstand his character. We're going to misunderstand his relation to the sinner as well, the lawbreaker. We're going to misunderstand God's relation to the lawbreaker if we misunderstand the character of God's law. So the devil, when he wants to change times and laws, he doesn't merely want to change the law by removing certain laws. That makes it too obvious. But he also wants to change our conception, our understanding of God's law and how it relates to us and its functionality. So let's compare God's law to man's law, right? With man's law, the strength of secular law, the strength of man's 
law is found in its punishment. I'm going to say that again. The strength of man's law is found in its punishment. So in certain places in the United States, I'm going to give an example so that we can see very clearly. In certain places in the United States, in certain states, there are some relaxed laws when it comes to, let's say, uh, drugs. There are certain relaxed laws in some states. And in other states, there are stronger laws, right? What makes one law stronger than the other? What makes one law stronger than the other? Well, what makes one law stronger in one state is the punishment for breaking that law. So for example, if you have a certain drug in, 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 in a state where it's illegal, let's say hypothetically, for example, then they'll give you 10 years in jail. So that's a really strong law. Why? Because its punishment is really strict. Its punishment is if you break this law, then you are going to be broken by having 10 years in jail. Okay. Now in another state where you may have the same exact drug, they may say, we'll just make you do community service for five weeks. So that law is not as strong as the other law that says 10 years in jail. So we see that, that secular worldly laws, human laws, find their strength in the degree of their punishment. Secular laws find their strength in the degree of their punishment. So they are enforced. They are enforced. They find their force by the strength of their punishment. So the stronger the punishment, the stronger the law. The stronger the punishment, the stronger the law. I hope that's clear. The stronger the punishment, the stronger the law. Now, that's man's law, but God's law. God's law. God's law does not require punishment to be made strong. God's law does not require punishment to be made strong, to be strengthened or to be enforced. God's law does not require punishment to be made strong or to be enforced. God's law does not need strength. It's a revelation of his character. God is omnipotent. It does not need strength because inherently, inherently, it doesn't need strength because it is, even as God is. God's law does not need to be made strong or to be made stronger because God's law is. It is the requirement of life. It is the requirement of life. It is not a law that you have to keep this or, 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 or else. No, if you don't keep it, then you will not be. That law is. If you do not keep it, then you will not be. Because in order to be, in order to live, you need to function according to God's Law is the law of life. It's the protocol of life. It is the way that we are designed to live according to that law. Very important that you get this. God's laws do not require strength because they are, even as God is. He is the great I am, right? God's law does not command you to respect it. God's law does not command you to respect it because God's law is respectable. God's law is inherently respectable. It doesn't command you to respect it. So whenever we may read that God's law commands respect, we need to understand it as meaning that God's law, the way that it is, this is, this is the requirement. This is just how things function. Okay, this is how things function. This is how things function. So God's laws, they're not a system of rules that God uses as a guide to determine the degree of punishment for the sinner. Okay, God's laws are not a system of rules that God uses as a guide to determine the degree of punishment for the sinner. Okay, the righteousness that God wants cannot be accomplished. It cannot be accomplished by rule keeping. The righteousness that God wants from you and me, it can't be accomplished by rule keeping. It must be by heart change. 
there must be a change in the heart. Okay? The sinner, God's not busy like, oh, you're a sinner? I need to punish you. No, for sinners, God's business is as a physician, as a healer. There's a work in the heart that needs to get done. There's a work in the heart that needs to get done. So God's justice. So God's justice now is what? God's justice is to provide Jesus to heal the sin sick soul. God's justice is to provide Jesus who would then heal the sin sick soul. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. I want us to see the way that Paul spoke about the law of God. Romans chapter 7. We're going to see how Paul spoke about the law of God. Romans chapter 7. And verse 12, Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. Notice how Paul spoke about the law of God. Look how Paul spoke about the law of God. Romans 7, verse, <clears throat> verse 12. Paul said, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Satan's attack is against the law of God. The Bible makes it very, very clear, and life makes it clear that. The law of God is holy, just, and good. Paul here in the book of Romans chapter 7 was speaking about his struggle. He was speaking about his struggle. He was speaking about how he sought to overcome sin. But then when he came across the 10th commandment, sin revived in him and he died, he said. He said, when I came across, you know, he was going through all the 10 commandments. But once he came across the 10th commandment, he, he felt like a complete loser. He felt like a complete loser. He acknowledged that the law is holy, just, and good, but there's something wrong with him. It's there in verse, uh, it's there in verse seven that he says it. In verse seven, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had no, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. That's the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, etc. Right? Thou shalt not covet. So when Paul came across the, when he got to the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, what did he say? He said, but sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of, concupis of con concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Right? So, Paul came across that commandment, the Ten Commandments, with which, which if there was one commandment that is the most difficult commandment, if, then it would be the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. In other words, you shall not want to sin. That's the Tenth Commandment. That's the principle. That's the spirit of the Tenth Commandment. You shall not want to sin. Can, can that be legislated? Can that be legislated? That commandment, thou shalt not want to sin, that is a work that can only go on inside of your and my heart. And so that is why, that is why we say that 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 that, that God's laws, it's not a system of rules that God is using as a guide to determine the degree of punishment for the sinner. But rather, it is a revelation of his character of love. And in order to experience the righteousness that the law reflects, because the law is a reflector of the righteousness of God, in order to experience that righteousness, there must be heart change. God has to do something in your and my heart so that we will not want to sin. Because wanting to sin is sin. Wanting to sin is sin. That's, I hope that that's very clear for you, saints. Wanting to sin is sin. Sin. Now, somebody may ask, wait, but what about, but what about temptation? Isn't temptation wanting to sin? Is that what the Bible says? One may ask, well, isn't temptation wanting to sin? No, the Bible does not say this. The Bible does not say this. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say concerning, what does the Bible say concerning what exactly, uh, uh, what exactly temptation is? <clears throat> James chapter 1 and verse 12. 
James chapter one and verse 12, follow me very, very carefully. James chapter one and verse 12, it says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tempted, for when he is tempted, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised. Verse 13, for let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So you see that temptation is not when you want to sin. Temptation is when you are drawn by the lust of the flesh, drawn by his own lust and enticed. So temptation is when you are drawn by the lust of your flesh, okay? Temptation is not wanting to sin. Temptation is when your flesh is drawing you, seeking to pull you into doing that which is wrong, into wanting to sin, or into breaking the tenth, the, 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 the fourth commandment, the fifth commandment, the sixth commandment, etc. okay? So the distinction, a clear distinction between temptation and a wanting to sin. Temptation is when you are drawn by the lust of the flesh. Wanting to sin is when your mind desires evil. Jesus, now those saints who have studied the 1888 message of righteousness by faith and who have delved deeply into the righteousness of Christ, understand that Christ took upon himself our fallen sinful human nature. Christ took that upon himself. And in taking that upon himself, he could feel temptation. Never wanted to sin because he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Never wanted to sin, but felt the pull that you and I feel. He felt the pull to do his own will instead of doing the will of the Father. He felt that. He didn't want that, but he felt that. Clear distinction. Clear distinction. That's why understanding Christ our righteousness in all of its parts is very important. The righteousness of, the righteousness of Christ, meaning the quality of Christ's righteousness. The quality of Christ's righteousness is the result of gaining victory over every single temptation and over every single sin that the fallen human nature could feel, that, the, that we can even imagine. That is the quality of the righteousness of Christ. Adam did not have that. The quality of the righteousness of Christ is a righteousness that has faced every single species of sin and temptation and has successfully overcome them all. And more than we can think, more than we can even imagine. Because Christ was tempted as God. One may say, well, the Bible did say that God cannot be tempted. That is true. God cannot be tempted. But Christ, who is God, not the Father, he is the Son. Christ, who is God, what did he do? He took upon himself, he covered his Godhood, he covered his divinity with our fallen sinful humanity so he could feel our temptation. So while he is God, he put himself in a situation where he could feel temptation. And he over came. He overcame everything that we can imagine and even more. And that's why through Christ, we are not merely conquerors, but we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus that loved us. So the law of God. So as Paul understood the law of God, he understood, he came to understand that wanting to sin is wrong and he needs a heart change. He needs a heart change. He needs for there to be a change in his heart. God doesn't change anybody's heart by punishing them. He changes hearts by healing them. The ministry of healing, the ministry of healing. Um, in, in our previous studies, we had gone through uh, in the book, The Desire of Ages, page 761, page 761, paragraph four, where it says in the, in the opening of the great controversy, Satan declared that the law of God could not be obeyed. This chapter is speaking about the law of God. That's why I'm spending time here speaking about the law of God, because this chapter speaks about the law of God and how the devil seeks to, you know, um, uh, give us a wrong conception of God's law and also uh, 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 try to diminish the importance of the law of God. And I'm trying to show us, saints, I'm trying to show us the importance of God's law. I'm trying to show us the importance of God's law. So we had read in the book of the Desire of Ages, page 764, and I should just pull it up. Desire of Ages, 764, DA7. And this was a, a very important, uh, 761, pardon me, pardon me, 761, paragraph four. This was a very important statement that we had read from the chapter, It Is Finished. If there is one chapter that I would call the most important chapter in the book of Desire of Ages, it is this chapter, chapter 79, It Is Finished. That is probably the most important chapter in the book, The Desire of Ages, the most. And it says in the beginning, in the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed. 
that justice was inconsistent with mercy and that should the law be broken, <clears throat> it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Every sin must meet its punishment, urge Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. So here the devil is saying that sin must be punished. Sin, every sin must meet its punishment. That's what he was urging. Every sin must meet its punishment. That's what Satan was urging. Now, if Satan were correct about God's law, if Satan were correct about God's law, and we know what he thinks about God's law, he thinks that it's no good. He thinks that it's unnecessary. He thinks we can be holy without God's law. If Satan is correct about God's law, then of necessity, he would be correct about how it should be handled if it is broken. I'm going to say that again. If Satan is correct in his assessment of God's law, then he should also be correct about how it should be handled if it is broken. Now, we already covered how the world takes care of a broken law. And we saw how the devil has been ruling the world through Babylon, Medo-Persia, Medo Grecia, um, uh, 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 Rome, both in both of its phases, pagan and papal Rome. How do you see that the, the outworking of law and order through those governments that were under the control of the enemy of all souls? We see that the way that it was taken care of was that you break this law, we break you. That's the punishment. That's how it works. That's how our laws work. That's how the devil's law work. And that's why he was urging, he was urging God in saying that every sin must meet its punishment. If, you, if, if, if God's law is broken, then the one who breaks that law must be punished. That is how he presents the law of God. He presents the law of God in the way that, in the way that he would handle it. That's how he would handle it. And, we, and history shows us the way that he handles those that break his laws. He breaks them. But God's law is completely different. God's law is that when you break it, it is because you are already broken. When you break it, it's because you're broken. There's something wrong on the inside. There's something wrong inside of your heart. So God is in the business of restoring because you are broken. He's not going to break you more because you are already broken. So God does the work of the ministry of healing. God is in the business of doing the work of the ministry of of healing. So I say again that if Satan were correct about God's law, he would be correct about how it should be handled if broken. And we know that God, that Satan is not correct about God's law. Therefore, he's not correct of how God's law should be handled when humans break it. Now, I should continue reading on page on 760, 760, um, 762, 762. Yes, because we need to understand that when you break God's law, sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's the result of the breaking of God's law, the breaking of any law, right? Uh, the law of gravity. If you break the law of gravity, if you stand on top of a building, you break the law of gravity by jumping off of that building. Um, what is going to be the result? You're going to die. You are going to die because you cannot fly. God's law requires righteousness. See that? God's law requires righteousness. A righteous life, a perfect character, very important. It requires a perfect character. And this man has not to give. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. But Christ, thank God for Jesus, coming to earth as man lived a holy life and developed a perfect character. It's a character that needs to be developed because, it, because, because again, the quality of the righteousness of Christ, it is a righteousness that has faced every single species of sin and temptation and has successfully overcome them all. That takes time to do that. You have to face temptation and gain the victory over it in order to, to, to develop the righteousness that Christ developed, which is the result of the faith of Jesus. So the faith of Jesus produces the righteousness of Jesus. The righteousness of Jesus is a righteousness that has faced every single species of sin and temptation and has successfully overcome them all. And that's the righteousness that is made available to us. That's what it says. It says, these he offers as a free gift to all who will receive them. A free gift. So that is grace. Oh, it highlighted the whole entire thing. I wasn't trying to highlight. Well, maybe the Lord wants this whole entire thing to be highlighted. I just wanted to highlight that one sentence. But God maybe wanted the whole, you guys saw it. I didn't make this up. He wanted the whole thing to be highlighted because this paragraph is important. <clears throat> these he offers as a free gift 
to all who will receive them. To all who will what? To all who will receive them. So justice, justice is God saving everyone who wants to be saved. And it is allowing those who want to be lost to be lost. But with justice, there God's love being in there, God still attempts to save those who want to be lost and they make up their mind to be lost. That is justice. That is God's justice. So, so these he offers as a free gift to all who will receive them. His life stands, that is the life of Christ, stands for the life of men. Thus, they have a remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Sins that are passed through the what? Through the forbearance of God. That's very important. The forbearance of God. Forbearance is long suffering. Forbearance is long suffering. If you were on our prayer line earlier this morning, we were talking about long suffering. You want to read Mount, uh, My Life Today, page 52. You should read that devotional. ML 52. My Life Today, page 52. It will bless your heart. My Life Today, page 52. You should read that. My Life Today, page 52. ML 52. That's what we read earlier this morning on the prayer line. And it was a great blessing. So thus they have remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. More than this, Christ, so it's not just a forgiveness. It's not just the long suffering of God, but more than this, Christ imbues men with the attributes of God. So he, he removes sin, but then he puts in the righteousness of God in you. He doesn't just declare you righteous and you're still like a bad person. No, he actually makes you righteous through his word. Christ imbues men with the attributes of God. He builds up the human character after the similitude of the divine character, a goodly fabric of spiritual strength and beauty. Thus, the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer in Christ. God can be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? God can be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. You see, it is right for God to save those who have chosen salvation. That makes God just. Saving those who have chosen salvation through Christ, experiencing his righteousness in their life, it is just. It reveals the justice of God when he saves them. That's why he is just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. He remains just even if people are not saved because he has sought to save them. He has shown himself as one who can be trusted, but they have rejected him. But that doesn't change the fact that God is just. So he's just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. This salvation is is the healing of the sin-sick soul. The sin problem, law transgression, uh, uh, fueled by unbelief, is not so much a legal problem as it is a lethal problem, right? The sin problem, which is law transgression, fueled by unbelief, unbelief being the source, and law transgression being the, the, the outworking, Unbelief being the root, law transgression being the fruit. It is not so much a legal problem as it is a lethal problem. It's a deadly issue inside of our hearts. And so God's business is to save the sin sick soul from the impending destruction that is coming upon them because of sin. We take the example of, 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 of the destruction of Jerusalem, right? We've shared this um, in the previous years, and we often share this about the destruction of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was destroyed, when Jerusalem was destroyed, it is often looked upon as God's punishment upon Jerusalem, right? It is often looked upon as God's punishment upon those that were in Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, right? But if we go to Great Controversy, page 36, 
Great Controversy, page 36, reading paragraph one. Notice what it says. Again, we're understanding the law of God, how it functions, what it is, because the devil wants us to misunderstand it. And throughout this chapter of the Great Controversy, chapter 36, which is where we are, right? I'm pulling from other places within the Great Controversy and the Spirit of Prophecy so that we can understand very, very clearly the validity and the importance of the law of God and how uh, uh, pernicious and how terrible the enemy of all souls is in trying to invalidate God's law. <clears throat> so I'll read from the highlighted section. It says, but when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, let me pause there, the limits of divine forbearance. Well, does God's mercy have any limits? Yes or no? Or yes or no? Does God's mercy have any limit? Is there a limit to God's mercy? Hmm? Is there a limit to God's mercy? Is there a limit to God's mercy? That's a question. Is there a limit to God's mercy? <clears throat> well, let's see what the Bible has to say about that. Let me see here. I'm trying to, there's so many places where this is said. And so I'm looking for this. Just in, in, in one particular place. All right. And let's go to the book of Psalms to see whether or not there is a limit to God's mercy. Psalm chapter, well, we could take our pick. Um, let's just take Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I call upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. So it's said over and over and over again here in the word of God that God's mercy endures forever. So there's no limit to God's mercy. But we're reading here in the spirit of prophecy that there are limits to divine forbearance, which is God's mercy, long suffering, right? It's God's mercy. So what does that mean? What that means, how we are to understand that is that it is we that limit God's ability to exercise mercy towards us. So there's no limit to God's mercy. It is we that place a limit on God's mercy. So it's like God is giving us, right? But we're moving the mercy to the side and just receiving his wrath. We're moving his mercy to the side and just receiving the result of our sin. We're moving his mercy to the side and receiving just the result of our sin. At least when we receive the results of our sin mingled with God's mercy, we can, we can deal with it. It's still painful, but we could deal with it. But when we receive the results of our sin and reject God's mercy, well, that's what the Jews experienced there in the destruction of Jerusalem. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. God does not stand. Listen, watch this here. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejecter of his mercy. Do you see that? He leaves the rejecter of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. So they are left to reap what they have sown, okay? So they are rejectors, and that is how they limit God's forbearance, God's long-suffering, God's mercy. Every of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God. So you see that? Every transgression of the law of God, we're talking about the law of God, is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, is at last withdrawn from the sinner. And then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. It's either the enmity of Satan that you're receiving or just you're just receiving the, the result of your sin without Satan being involved. <clears throat> the destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. Never was there given a more decisive testimony of God's hatred of sin 
and to the certain punishment that will fall upon the guilty. So you see how she describes God's punishment? You see how the spirit of prophecy described God's punishment? Because the devil says sin must be punishment, must be punished, right? And we see that God's law, the way that it functions, it's not you break it and God breaks you, but it's that you break it because you are broken. But now here we're reading, so Dwight is saying that this shows the certain punishment that will fall upon the guilty. So how is God's punishment described in the spirit of prophecy? How is God's punishment described in the spirit of prophecy? God's punishment is what you experience as a result of your sin. God's punishment is what you experience as the result of your sin and the rejection of God's mercy. That is God's punishment. It is you, again, receiving the result of your sin while you reject God's mercy and God's forbearance. That is God's punishment. That's not the way our punishment is because you see the wrath of man work is not the righteousness of God in the same way as the punishment of man is not in the same way as the punishment of God. The, the mechanism of divine punishment is different than the mechanism of human punishment. There is a difference between the two, and it must be clear in our minds. The devil would have us think that the mechanism of divine punishment is the same way as the mechanism of human punishment. And here in the spirit of prophecy, we see that it is different. Human punishment is, 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 is imposed. Human punishment is imposed. God's punishment is when he has been rejected. God's punishment is when he has been rejected. Man's laws are imposed. God's law is not imposed. God's law is just the way that life is designed to work. It's not imposed. It's the way that life is designed to function. It's the way that life is designed to function. So, now, continuing to move on in our study, as we are looking at the Great Controversy, chapter 36. Now, I want us to continue here. I want us to continue here as, we, uh, as we're looking at question number two. So we had uh, settled. We, we, we really, I wanted to spend time here, and we spent good time here looking at the main issue in the Great Controversy is concerning the law of God, which is the revelation of God's character of love. And so we just went through here how we should understand the law of God and how we should understand God's character so that we won't be so easily moved by the devil's misinterpretation and misrepresentation of the character of God. Because that's what he did in order to cause there to be war in heaven. And that's what he did to, for there to be the per, per, perpetuation of the war here on earth. So now coming to number two, why is the doctrine that God's law is no longer binding upon man Opposed to reason and pernicious in its results. Why is it that the why is the doctrine that God's law is no longer binding upon man opposed to reason? Why is that opposed to reason? Well, 584, 584 in the book The Great Controversy. So why is it? Well, as you continue to read there, um, there in 584, paragraph one to 585, paragraph one, it, it goes through the fact that. Um, that the laws in this world, laws in this world, uh, uh, the, lo the laws of the state determine how civility and prosperity will be preserved. Okay. The law is set up in this world. They're not bad laws, um, but they are set up to determine how civility and prosperity can be preserved because without laws, then everybody would just be uh, the strongest would be the richest and the weakest would be the poorest. The strong would just take everything by strength and the weaker ones will just have to deal with whatever crumbs are made available if they are made available. So that is the laws of the world. It's there to preserve us as long as possible in our sinful state. And it's just a matter of time until things break down necessarily. We see that again with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Grecia, Rome in both of its phases right? It's not founded on love, right? It's, it's the scaffolding for it to be able to stand up. So there are some good laws, yes, but it's not founded upon God's law of love. And so therefore it eventually breaks down and morphs over time, right? So being that man has laws, should it not be expected that, that, that the creator of the universe also has laws so that the world can function properly? Of course. 
God has des- has its design laws. It's a, it's laws of how we are designed to function. That's the term that determines how life can be preserved. Now, when man decided to go fully against the ideas of God's laws, we see that we see how it works out in the French Revolution. You remember in the French Revolution, atheism was literally legalized. Atheism was 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 the way that things were going to go. Atheism, atheism was the way that things were going to go. So when we look at the French Revolution, so that's 584. Um, uh, uh, matter of fact, let, 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 let's just read it, right? No error accepted by the Christian world strikes more boldly against the authority of heaven. None is more directly opposed to the dictates of reason. None is more pernicious in its results than the modern doctrine. So rapidly gaining ground that God's law is no longer binding upon men. Every nation has its laws, which command respect and obedience, right? So now going down to this next highlight, terrible were the scenes enacted in France when atheism became the controlling power. It was then demonstrated to the world that to throw off the restraints which God has imposed is to accept the rule of the cruelest of tyrants. Okay. So to throw off God's laws is to throw off, is to, is, to, is to allow yourself to be overthrown. Now, I'm interested in the fact that it's that Sister White wrote on inspiration. Um, the you know, that it was then demonstrated to the world that to throw off the restraint which God has imposed is to accept the rules of the cruelest tyrants. Now, we just said a moment ago that God's laws are not imposed, right? But over here, the language used is that God has imposed, is that um, it, it, it was demonstrated to the world that, 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 that to throw off the restraints which God has imposed is to accept the rules of the cruelest of tyrants. So what's going on? It seems as though there's a there, there's no harmony. No issues at all. When you read in the book, The Great Controversy and the introduction of The Great Controversy, and we actually have a whole entire study where, we, where we're talking about Bible language and the language of uh, inspiration, we are told that uh, the prophets of God, they are God's penmen. They're not God's pen. Right. And so what that means is that as we read through inspiration, we are to take from it what it means. We are to understand the context of what it's saying, the idea of what it's saying. Yes, context and also the idea of what is being brought forth. There are often in in the Bible many different idioms, metaphors that are used for us to be able to understand um, what what the what what the Jews who, who were writing it were trying to say. Now, under inspiration here, it's being said, okay, God has imposed these laws and rules, etc. But, not but, but and, as we had considered a moment ago, right, God's law is not something that he imposes on you. When we understand the fact that God's law is the way that we're designed to work, is the way that we're designed to function. So here, it's simple language that is not deterring from what we were sharing a moment ago, but it's it's it, Sister White often does this as you as you read through the Spirit of Prophecy a lot. Sister White will often use stronger words to make the point. She will use stronger words to make the point. There, there are other places where, where where I don't have examples on me right now. But there are other places in the Spirit of Prophecy where she'll use very strong language to make a point. It's, it's sort of like parables. You know, parables are not to be taken literally, right? They are stories that God gives in order to teach us a point. Okay, they're not prophecy, but they are prophetic guides. That's how we are to take it. Okay, so now that that's the French Revolution, right? Um, we see the result of re- rejecting God's law. We see, it's unreasonable because you have things like the French Revolution that are a result. Also, property people <coughs> people begin to lose their property. Things are no longer safe, right? When 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 God's law law is rejected, things are no longer safe. Why? Because People are going against the will and the ways of God. And people just take things by force, which is against God's way. So now question number three, what present day evils may be noted? And I move quickly because there's somewhere else that I want to get to. Um, what present day evils may be noted as the logical result of the teaching that men are released from obeying God's laws? What present evils may be noted as logical results. 
Well, we could think about that, right? What are present day evils that are going on that are a result of rejecting God's law? Well, present day evil, well, do you, let's just look at the home. Let's look at the home. What is going on in the home in the world today? Some people are suggesting that uh, it's okay if there's no father in the home. Single parenthood, is it's, it's fine. We could just join and be as a community and raise children in that way, right? Many people have that belief. There are some that have the belief in polygamy, that a man can have multiple wives, right? There are some that believe that, that, that uh, in, in, in uh, you know, that there are some people that believe in marital, corporal discipline. There are some people that believe in marital, corporal discipline. And when I heard that, I was like, this is crazy. Like, what? And I remember I saw a video uh, several months ago where this, this is completely insane, where there was a, there's a young lady and she wanted that whenever she did something wrong for her husband to, uh, to punish her, like she wanted him to punish her when she did bad things. At first he thought it was weird, but then after he got, he just went along with it. She wanted him to punish her when she did something wrong. Warped mind unreasonable. There was another thing uh, in the same like series that I saw where there was a, a, a woman and in her relationship with another man, she, she wanted to be treated like a dog. Yeah. Like she would have, she had a collar and a chain and he would literally like, you know, go out on walks with her and she would be on all fours just walking. Um, he had a place for her to be able to sleep like a, like a, you know, like a little basket, whatever. And she would sleep there. She wanted him to treat her like a dog insane insane what happens to the mind of man when god is not dwelling therein it's illogical it is crazy now in the world all the injustices that we see in the world is a result of the rejection of the law of god as isaiah put it in isaiah 59 and verse 14 justice stands afar off for truth is fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter equity cannot enter it's a sad case. It is a very, very sad case. So question number four, I was going to uh, connect something with that, but I pause I'll, and I'll connect it later. Question number four, whenever or wherever, whenever or wherever the Bible can no longer be suppressed and religious liberty prevails, how does Satan seek to affect what he formerly accomplished through ignorance and persecution. How has rejection of the truth regarding the Sabbath led to lawlessness? So this is an important one. This is a very important question here. This is a mightily important question. This is a very, very important question. Whenever or wherever the Bible can no longer be suppressed, meaning this is a place where the Bible is free and everywhere, wherever the Bible is free and everywhere and religious liberty prevails. So they believe that everybody has the freedom to choose what they want to believe. How does Satan seek to affect what he has formerly accomplished through ignorance and persecution? So whenever there's a land where there's freedom of choice, where there's liberty to choose um, what you want to believe, whatever religion that you want to um, abide by, whenever there's a place where the Bible is accepted, the Bible can be anywhere. You could, you could read the Bible wherever you want. What methods does this devil use? What method does the devil use in order... What method did the devil use in order to accomplish his ends, which is of persecution? Well, I'm going to pull it up here. What the devil does, what the devil does is he works through churches by sowing the seeds of skepticism concerning the word of God. That's what he does. He works through the churches to sow the seeds of skepticism concerning the word of God. And he brings false doctrines such as the immortality of the soul, eternal torment, and the uselessness of the Sabbath in order to pervert the world. Let's read. The iniquity and the iniquity and spiritual darkness that prevails under the supremacy of Rome were the inevitable result of her suppression of the scriptures. But where is but where is to be found the cause of the widespread infidelity, the rejection of the law of God? and the consequent corruption under the full blaze of gospel light in an age of religious freedom. Where is that to be found? 
Now that Satan can no longer keep the world under his control by withholding the scripture, he resorts to other means to accomplish the same object. To destroy the to destroy faith in the Bible serve his, serves his purpose as well as to destroy the Bible itself. So now he doesn't care to destroy the Bible. He cares to destroy our faith in the Bible. By introducing the belief that God's law is no longer binding, he has effectually he, he as effectually leads men to transgress as if they were wholly ignorant of its precepts. And now, as in former ages, he has worked through the church. He has worked through the church to further his designs. So he's not merely work, he's not working. Well, he is working against the church, but he's working against the church by working in the church. We have greater to fear from within than from without. The religious organizations of the day have refused to listen to unpopular truths plainly brought to view in the scriptures. And in combating them, they have adopted interpretations and taken possession with positions which have sown broadcast the seeds of skepticism, clinging to the papal error of natural immortality and man's consciousness in death. They have rejected the only defense against the delusions of spiritualism. The only defense against the delusions of spiritualism is what? Understanding the truth concerning the immortality of the soul, meaning the immortality of the soul is not true. That's false doctrine. And understanding that what else is false doctrine is what? Immortality of man conscience, con consciousness and death. And um, well, the other point that she had brought up earlier was the, uh, the, the, the it was eternal torment. And we're going to come to that very, very shortly. Matter of fact, right here. The doctrine of eternal torment has led many to disbelieve the Bible. The doctrine of eternal torment have, le have led many to disbelieve the Bible. It's not the sanctuary. Some people think, oh, if I teach the sanctuary, people are not going to believe. No, no, no. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. That's not what, 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 what causes people to disbelieve the Bible. What causes people to disbelieve the Bible? Foremost, the doctrine of eternal torment has led many to disbelieve the Bible because that doctrine is unreasonable. We went through that before in, in our past studies, how it destroys reason, the idea of eternal torment. And as the claims of the fourth commandments are urged upon the people, it is found that the observance of the seventh day Sabbath is enjoined. And as the only way to free themselves from a duty, which they are unwilling to perform, many popular teachers declare that the law of God is no longer binding binding. Thus they cast away the law and the Sabbath together as the work of the Sab of Sabbath reform extends this rejection of the divine law to avoid the claims of the fourth commandment will become well nigh universal. It will eventually become universal. The teachings of religious leaders have opened the door to infidelity and to spiritualism and to contempt for God's holy for God's holy law. And upon these leaders rests a fearful responsibility for the iniquity that exists in the Christian world. Okay? So wherever the Bible is thriving and doing well and that there's religious freedom, the devil the devil will do what? The devil will work with the church to disqualify the Bible, to bring doubt upon the Bible, and also to destroy the law of God, especially the fourth commandment, knowing that the fourth commandment is the sign between God and his people that he is their God. So the devil doesn't need you to not have a Bible. The devil simply needs you to not believe in the Bible. The devil simply needs you to not believe in inspiration. Now, what gives, what is given, pardon me, what is given by some teachers of antinomianism as the reason for the prevailing iniquity and what is proposed by them as a remedy? Now, antinomianism, right? Antinomians, so antinomianism is, um, is the belief of a, 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 a lawlessness. That's what an antinomian is. It is belief of lawlessness. And in fact, 
uh, E.J. Wagner was being accused of being an antinomian when he was teaching how we should view and understand the law in connection with righteousness by faith. He was accused of being an antinomian, but he is not an antinomian. In fact, he was teaching about the validity of the law while the reverse was being understood, was being uh, interpreted. An antinomian is one who, who, who does not believe in the law. It's lawlessness. That's what it is. So teachers of antinomianism, right, they have their reasons for, um, for why there's prevailing iniquity in the world. And what they're, and they also have a proposition as to why, as to how that can be fixed. What is their reason? Their reason as to why there is so much iniquity in this world, their reason is because people are intemperate. That's their reason. It's connected with the temperance reform. They claim that iniquity prevails because people are being intemperate and are not observing Sunday. That's their reason. Because people are intemperate and not observing Sunday. This is truth mixed with error. This is truth mixed with error. And truth mixed with error is worse than blatant error. Because truth mixed with error is, is, is a bit more, uh, one would be more receptive to, to that because there's some truth there. But I want to pull this up on the screen here and let's read this. Here, the temperance work, one of the most prominent and important of moral reforms, is often combined with the Sunday movement. And the advocates of the latter represent themselves as laboring to promote the highest interests of society. So they claim to be promoting the highest interests in society. And those who refuse to unite with them are denounced as the enemies of temperance and reform. You're the enemies of law and order. You're an enemy of what will bring and preserve peace in the land. But the fact that a movement to establish error is connected with a work which in itself is good is not an argument in favor of the error. Just because there's a movement that's fighting against something that is wrong, that doesn't mean that that movement is right. If their premise is erroneous, okay? We may disguise poison by mingling it with wholesome food, but we do not change its nature. On the contrary, it's rendered more dangerous as it is more likely to be taken unawares. Okay, so it is one of Satan's devices to combine with falsehoods just enough truth to give it plausibility. Okay, just enough truth to give it plausibility. So with the temperance movement, was temp is temperance good? Yes, but it was connected with the Sunday movement. Is enforcing Sunday worship good? No. So we need to be very, very careful of, di of the different movements that are in the world that are seeking to promote justice or their version of justice without the righteousness of Christ. You have to be very, very careful with that. In fact, Sister White, um, and, I, and I always kept this statement on my phone and I'm going to use it now. Um, Sister White, um, she didn't concern herself with the women's rights movement. She was alive in that time. She didn't concern herself with the women's rights movement. So they were really pushing for women's rights and voting rights and things like that. And there was a woman that came to Sister White and was telling her how the, the burden that was on her heart. And Sister White just, you know, explained to her that, you look, my work is of another character. My work is of another character. I'm not saying that what you're talking about is not important. But what I'm saying is that my work is of another character. You could read that in um, uh, the book DG, which is Daughters of God. It's on page 200. Matter of fact, I can just pull it up, being that we're here. Let me pull it up so that we could see it together. Um, DG, uh, 253, 253, paragraph, um, <clears throat> well, 252, paragraph one, 252, paragraph one. And uh, let's notice it here. Let's see. 252. Oh, paragraph seven, not one. Paragraph seven. Here it is. Here it is. You just highlight that in yellow. Ellen White did not concern herself with women's rights movement. When she was urged to join others in the crusade for women's suffrage, she declined the invitation. She wrote to her husband. She just declined the invitation. And uh, and this is pretty much the letter. We're not going to read through it. But, um, you know, Mrs. Graves is the individual that was speaking to her uh, about it and whatnot. And um, 
Uh, matter of fact, I'll read, I'll read the last portion here. I told her that my mind was unprepared for any such matter as women voting. She had been thinking and dwelling upon these things, and her mind was ripe upon them, while my work was of another character. We were doing upon we were doing upon the point of temperance what no other class of people in the world were. We were as much in favor of a pledge against tobacco as liquor. Okay. So here she's making the point that basically what I gather from that is that we are we are we are already doing more for the temperance movement than those who are claiming to be uh, in the temperance movement have done. We're doing more than anyone in the world has been doing. So when it comes to, comes to any injustices that are going on in this world, any injustices that are going on in this world, God has given his remnant people the answer. He has given to his remnant people the solution. And we are to be doing more than anyone in the world when it comes to whether it is injustice against uh, black people, whether it is injustice against women, whether it is injustice against anyone or anything. Right. Because those are like, you know, the the, the popular uh, 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 kind of like uh, headlines, you know, black injustice against black people. So there's Black Lives Matter movement. There's this movement. There's that movement, this movement and that movement and this movement and that movement. So many different movement when God has called us to be the final movement that will actually finish the work. None of those movements will finish the work. Not one of those movements will finish the work. God has a remnant people who is the final movement, who has the answer to all of those other movements. Every single one of those other movements, God has an answer to every single one of them in his last day church. The solution is found there. It is found there in the gospel that he has given to his last day church. The question is, what are we doing with it? The question is, what are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? Those other movements, they're just highlighting like, okay, Black Lives Matter, for example, they're, they're highlighting specifically you know, Black Lives Matter, and um, and they are pretty sketchy. Like, they, they, I think that there's some um, there's uh, uh, lawsuits against them because they've received so much money, but they used it, um, you know, un unwisely or unfairly or whatnot. So it's like stuff like that, corruption like that. It's like, well, that says a lot. Is it important to be able to to, to fight against injustice? Yeah, but if you form a movement and you're and you're corrupt like that, it's like, you know, we're, we're trying to do good, but then the movement is corrupt. Good idea. But then after that, there's there's corruption going on in the in the in leadership of the organization and whatnot. That is so unfortunate. That is just so unfortunate. So our thing is what our thing is the gospel, and the gospel answers every single one of those issues. And God and He God puts a burden on every one of our hearts. He gives us the gospel, and everyone has a certain burden for a certain area. And so when we have the gospel, we have the answer to that specific burden. Whatever uh, whatever burden might be on your heart, God has the gospel for you to receive to answer the problem in those areas. But if you're just doing it and it is not God that is leading you, you'll find corruption like you find in so many other different organizations that are in the world. Okay. So let, and let me read this. This, this is taken from um, uh, councils uh, to, uh, this is taken from uh, councils on health, <coughs> page 436. It says every true reform has its place in the work of the third angel's message. Especially does the temperance reform demand our attention and support. The Women's Christian Temperance Union is an organization with whose efforts for the spread of temperance principles we can heartily unite. The light has often been given me that we are not to stand aloof from them. But while there is to be no sacrifice of principle on our part, part, as far as possible, we are to unite with them in laboring for temperance reform. So we shouldn't be aloof to all the different movements. We should be aware of what they're about, what they stand for. We shouldn't be aloof. Wherever we can unite, we should. Wherever we can unite, we should. But we should never ever let go or sacrifice principle. You should never, ever let go of or sacrifice principle. Now, upon two fundamental errors, upon two fundamental errors, will nominal Christendom unite? We're winding down. 
Upon two fundamental errors will Christendom unite. Upon what two fundamental errors will Christendom unite? What threefold union will result? And what will this be a sign of? All right. What will this be a sign of? Well, we have the answer right here. We're going to read it straight from the great controversy. What are the two fundamental errors that will unite Christendom, nominal Christendom? The immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness is what will unite all of nominal Christendom. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions, while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome, and Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the abyss. Stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss and clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, that is spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, and Romanism, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. They will trample upon the rights of God's people to exercise the freedom to choose what they will believe. That's the threefold union. Those who were in our class where we were considering um, the close of probation just before the second coming of Jesus, the final events just before the close of probation, final events just before the close of probation, we were considering the threefold union and what that meant. So you can go back to our study where it was the final class and we talk about it there. So we move along here. That threefold union is going to be formed. Again, Spiritualism, apostate Protestantism is going to reach out their hand to spiritualism and also reach out to uh, Romanism and they will be united threefold. Um, it will be a sort of a false trinity, you could say, right? And so that's what's going to happen, that threefold union. And then what's going to happen, the result of that, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. It's like the, 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 the full formation <clears throat> of the image of the beast. Now, what role is played by spiritualism in affecting the union of Protestantism and Catholicism? We want to highlight a little bit the role of spiritualism in all this. We want to highlight the role of spiritualism in all this. And I, I highlighted a couple of things here to highlight the role of spiritualism in uniting uh, 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 Protestantism, apostate Protestantism, and uh, Catholicism. Well, Satan himself is, uh, well, as spiritualism, uh, as spiritualism uh, more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, so it just imitates it, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. He's going to do that. False Christ. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed and many undeniable wonders will be performed. We covered this before already. Um, in fact, in the next chapter, scripture, a safeguard there, we see that these things are going to be real. And the only thing that we will be able to find safety in is in the word of God. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan is determined to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Papists, who boast of miracles as a sign, as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by the wonder working power and Protestants having cast away the shield of truth will also be deluded. No, there are certain factions of Christianity, professed Christianity that only believe, that believe in miracles, miracles, miracles. But we understand that we should not depend upon miracles to have faith. We should not depend upon miracles to have faith. We should not expect God to make a miracle so that we can believe in him. We should believe in him because he's believable. We shouldn't demand that God perform miracles so that we can believe in him. We should believe him because he is believable. We should trust him because he is trustworthy. We should love him because he is lovable. You see, 
But there are some who just believe in miracles, miracles, miracles. But we are to understand that miracles will be done in the in the latter days. People will actually be healed. And we need to understand the character of what is being done. We need to understand the character of what is being done. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he is he works as a destroyer. He works as a destroyer. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin. Intemperance ruin, destroys, dethrones reason. It destroys reason. Satan delights in war, etc. Satan delights in war. <clears throat> he delights in these things. He's the destroyer. So we just saw here how spiritualism is going to play a role in uniting everyone. Because spiritualism it is a false sense of Christianity. It is uh, it is uh, uh, the form of godliness. Oh, it looks like there are miracles. Oh, it looks like there are healing. It looks like that. But denying the power that is the character of God. Denying the power thereof. So much of that will be going on in the last days as Christianity unites, as apostate Christianity, apostate Protestantism unites with Catholicism and spiritualism. Now, again, as we are closing down here, in the, we're going to look at just two last questions to close. Um, and that's number eight and number 10. To what extent has, is Satan responsible for earthquakes and other elemental disasters? Why do the, they increase in frequency and severity? What false reasons will be given for these evils? Well, we know why they increase in, in the, why they increase in frequency and severity, right? Uh, because God's spirit is being withdrawn from the world, slowly being withdrawn from the world. So as God's spirit of order and temperance, you see, temperance is what? Temperance is self-control. Self-control is self-government. So governing self, governing people that's temperance self-control self-government right temperance is a fruit of the spirit so it comes from god so as the spirit of god is solely removed from the world so is the result so is the fruit the fruit of the spirit of god the result of the spirit of god is temperance self-control order government as the spirit of god is solely removed what happens to government Anarchy. Anarchy is what begins. Where every every man for themselves. Every man for themselves is what begins. War breaks out. And all things that we can't imagine. So that so as God's spirit is slowly moving, things will continue to necessarily get worse and out of control. So to what is the extent is Satan responsible for like the earthquakes and ele elemental disasters? disasters. Well, Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature. You see that? And he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. As far as God allows. God says this far and no further. But you see, as far as God allows means also as far as we allow. Because if God tells Satan this far and no further, right? If we continue in sin and we reject God, we reject his spirit, then Satan gets more ground. Satan gets more ground and God has to allow him to get more ground because we are choosing Satan. Justice is God allowing people to receive what they have chosen. If you have chosen salvation, then justice is God allowing you to receive and experience salvation. If you have chosen damnation, then justice is God allowing you to receive damnation. That is justice. That's the right thing to do. Justice is doing what is right. And it is right for God to allow those who want to be saved to experience salvation. It is right for God to allow those who want to be damned to experience damnation. It is right. That is God's justice. So when he was, so, 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 so Satan studied the secrets of the laboratory of nature and he uses all his powers to, to, 
to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another. As in a moment, it is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian, but it, but the Christian world have shown, shown contempt to the law of Jehovah. And the Lord will do just what he had declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessing. And really, it's not him like just taking it away, right? It's you rejecting it. So it's like, you know, it's like that. He will withdraw his blessing from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control over all whom God does not especially guard. Didn't we just read that previously in Great Controversy in, uh, in page 36, paragraph one and two? We just read that in chapter one. So if you go back to our chapter one study of the Great Controversy, it all comes full circle. It's the same thoughts that are being repeated over and over and over and over again. This is inspiration. God saw it fit that these points need to be repeated over and over and over again because we don't get it as we ought to. I didn't get it as I ought to, but keep on reading it over and over. And then God opens up our thoughts and our understanding. Okay. So he will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs, the devil. And he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to believe that it is God who's afflicting them. He will lead men to believe it's God. He is not only the accuser of the brethren, he's the accuser of God. Saying, oh, it's God that's punishing you because you're breaking the law. So because, so remember, Zyrages, page 761, paragraph four, Satan urges that, there, that those who break the law need to be punished. So now here, he's going to be, he's, he, he's going to be, he's, he has the same doctrine. He has the same doctrine. He's telling the people all this destruction is coming from God. God is afflicting you. God is punishing you because you have broken his law. This is why all this destruction, this is why all this is going on. God is afflicting you because you have broken his law. You see, you see what the devil is doing. The devil is trying to play God and then telling everybody it's God that's doing this. He's trying to play God and then he's telling everybody it's God that's doing this. God is always made out to be the bad guy and the devil always gets away with it. The devil, look in the Old Testament. You see so many places in the Old Testament where there's all this stuff that goes on and God takes the blame. God takes the blame and the devil is nowhere to be found. It is seldom in the Old Testament that the devil is brought up, seldom. Remember where I said that and God moved David to number the, the army, when you continue to read in the Bible, because I say it's, it's not often that, that the devil is brought up because the Jews were, were a monolithic religion. They're monolithic believers. Um, they only believe in one God. And whatever is good happens, that's God. Whatever is bad happens, that's God. But they some did get some understanding. The prophets did get some understanding at time. And so elsewhere, the prophet says that it was Satan that moved David to number his army. Okay. So Satan often gets away with a lot of things. He hides behind the language of the Bible. We've read that before in our studies, that he hides behind the language of the Bible where things make it look like it's God when really it's him. He will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs and he will bring trouble upon others and lead them to believe. Yeah, it is God who is afflicting them. So now we close here. In contrast with God's methods, it contrast God's method and Satan's for securing allegiance because both want to secure our allegiance. So we'll just read the paragraph that contrasts the difference between how God does something, how God does things, and how the devil does things. And then we close. And this is, here it is, a beautiful thought. God never... God never, God never, ever, God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant, but, sa but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he can otherwise, cannot otherwise seduce, 
is compulsion by cruelty. Compulsion by cruelty. Through fear and force in your home right now, do you operate through fear and force in order to get things done? Do you inspire your husband or your wife with fear in order to get something out of them? Do you manipulate them in that way? That's how the devil works. Through fear and force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. You see that? To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of the law, of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, uh, causing anarchy and corruption. So those, who, those of us who believe in the Sabbath, we're, it's going to be said, you are enemies of the people. You are the reason as to why all this affliction has happened. You're the reason as to why God is afflicting us, because you are breaking the law. You see how devilish that is? You see how devilish that is? They believe that they're being afflicted by God because they have broken the law. And God says, I don't function that way. I don't function. Your, your affliction is coming to you as a natural result of your, of your breaking my law. Now they're looking at those who are actually keeping the law and they're saying, we're suffering all this at the hand of God because of you. And so we need to break you. Because God is breaking us. They have a misapprehension of the character of God. They think that they need to break others because they believe that God is breaking them. Do you see that? Due to the fact that they misunderstand the character of God and the character of God's law and his government, they believe that because the God's law is being broken, God is breaking them. That's human law. That's the way human laws work. God's laws is the way that we are designed to live. Meaning if you go against God's law, then you begin to die. Not because God is interposing, but because you have gone against the way to live. So they're saying God is breaking us because we have broken his law. We're trying to keep his law by keeping Sunday, but you're not keeping his law because you're keeping the se seventh day Sabbath. So God continues to break us because we're breaking his law, but it's not us. It's actually you. You're the reason. And so now in the same way as God is breaking us because of your law transgression so that he will stop breaking us, we are going to break you. We're going to do what he does. We're going to do what we think that he does in order to end this suffering. So because they believe that God will break those that break his law, they figure, well, we're going to break those that are breaking God's law because that's what God would do anyway. So they're misrepresenting the character of God. That's what happened. And that was one of the reasons for, for the French Revolution. Because the papacy to the world was representing God. So because to the world they were representing God, in the French Revolution, they said, if that is how God is, we want nothing to do with him. So they completely rejected God. Completely rejected God. So it's important for us to have a right conception of the character of God, his government, and his law. Now, the final thing that I would read is this. As the Protestant churches reject the clear scriptural argument in defense of God's law, they will long to silence those whose faith they cannot overthrow by the Bible. Though they, blind, though they blind their own eyes to the fact that they are now adopting a course which will lead to the persecution of those who conscientiously refuse to do what the rest of the Christian world are doing and acknowledge the claims of the papal Sabbath. I'll read that again. Though they blind their own eyes to the, fa to the fact they are now adopting a course which will lead to the persecution of those who are consciously refusing, consci who consciously refuse to, <clears throat> to do what the rest of the Christian world are doing and acknowledge the claim of the papal Sabbath. They don't believe that they will persecute them, but they have already begun and they will continue to persecute unto death. Why? Because they misapprehend, misunderstand the character of God. They misunderstand the character of his government and they misunderstand the character of his law. God functions 
exactly the opposite of the enemy of all souls. He doesn't compel anyone to do anything. He doesn't force anybody to do anything. He doesn't put on you, you better do this or else. No, he shows you the way, the truth, and the life. And if you say, I don't want that, he doesn't run after you and say, no, you, you need to get on this way. He allows you to continue on your way because that is justice. He allows you to continue on your way. And the way of the transgressor is hard and it leads to death. But God doesn't give up easily on his children. He continues to reach out after them and he continues to seek to win them over to his side. God is still seeking you and your family. He's still seeking me as well. And he wants to win us to his side. And he knows, and that's why he has continue to have these studies with us, he knows that we need to get a clear understanding of his law and of his character. Have we come to the place where we understand our need of not only understanding God's law and his character, but experiencing it for ourselves? It's my prayer that you and your home, that you and your home may understanding may understand that there is an impending conflict and that we must choose this day whom we will serve and make sure that we make our calling and election sure by remaining on the side of Christ, by holding on to his law in our hearts and functioning according to those principles and increasing our views of God's character of love so that it may be reflected in our lives. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace, your love, and your mercy, and for these truths that we were able to consider in your word. We're thankful, God, that you love us and that you would teach us thoroughly your law and how it works and how the devil has sought so many different inventions and built so many different machinations so that we could reject your law or not take it as seriously as it is. Lord, help us as you continue to bring these thoughts back into our mind that they may settle in our minds and that we may really be Christians in our hearts. Lord, convert our homes, our churches, our communities, God. Be with us, God, that we may truly be the saints that you need for us to be in these last days. Lord, we would serve you and love you. We need you more than ever before, and we seek for more of your grace in our hearts. Bless every individual who is viewing and their families in a special way, and, and those who will view this later, that they may be touched and blessed thoroughly is my prayer. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, saints. I pray that God may richly bless you, that everything it is that we were able to consider in today's study may settle in your hearts and minds and may bring true conversion to you, to your families, and to all those whom you had shared this study with. If you'd like to join us on our prayer line every Sabbath at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can join whichever Sabbath you'd like. Just send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com and we'll be sure to respond with the link so you could join with us. You don't want to miss this afternoon's study on Clear Distinction Ministries a YouTube channel. It's at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, another wonderful study from the series Jesus on Prophecy. If you'd like to support the ministry and the work that we continue to do by the grace of God, then you could always do that through PayPal or Cash App. The links are provided in the description below. Or if you'd like to use Zelle Pay, you can always uh, use Zelle Pay. Our contact is lastrayministries at gmail.com. And know that the work, that, the, that whatever you give continues to further the gospel and the work that we're so blessed to do by the grace of God. We thank you. We love you. We pray that you may enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. God bless.